Today we build a home network on a budget. I will give 20 professional tips during this episode in order to share my learnings with you. The core components are the switch and the patch panel, which we may use to connect components to the network, such as the router that connects us to the internet using simple patch cables. But we may also connect additional components, such as outlets in other rooms where we may connect a PC or a laptop docking station, or another Wi-Fi access point, maybe for the first and second floor. If you're building this at home, my first tip is to use 19-inch components. That's industry standard and you will easily find components in the commerce. You do not have to go to the fully blown 6 feet rack, but there are a lot of smaller models available. Choose the one you like most. If you're building your own rack, you may want to make sure that you leave, let's say, 3 units spare so that you can easily add additional stuff later. If you add a shelf to the rack, then you can easily add components that are not made for 19-inch, such as a Raspberry Pi or a small PC, which you may want to use as a home server. Those shelves are available from $25, so not too expensive, but may save you a lot of headache later. Hey guys, welcome to my basement again. I just finished building this. This is a mock-up of a home budget network. So you might ask Mark, why are you not just showing your own network? Basically for two reasons. First, my network is my network and it doesn't really benefit you to see what my network is about because in this series, I want to enable you to build your own network. And secondly, looking at my closet, I thought it's a mess. You're not going to show that on YouTube. Well, I will. Have a look. Right. So I thought it's better to build this nice and clean mock-up so this way I can explain the components. I can explain to you how to wire the components. I can explain to you how to build your own home or small office home office network. The only piece in the installation that needs wiring really is the patch panel. And uh, I will show you how to put these cables on the patch panel in, in, in this video. Now, when you're doing this, make sure you leave enough cable so that you can take the patch panel out at a later point in time because you might want to add an additional cable and also it is best practice to fix the cables with those zippers or binders so that you, they are protected against damage. Because if you take out the patch panel, you might rip off a cable and need to redo everything again. When you do this, a good advice is to use colored cable binders. I'm using white cable binders in this video. But um, if you use color binders, you can easily identify where the cables come from. For example, the blue cables might come from the first floor, the red cables might come from the second floor, etc. This way, when you do extensions later, you can easily identify where the cables come from and that also saves you a, a lot of headache. Now, while you watch me putting in the cables, that might be a good opportunity to quickly click on the subscribe button. Thank you very much for that. Now, when you use those cable zippers, just uh, cut them with a cutter and when you put the the patch panel into the rack you can then fix it with the screws now when you put this patch panel in you might have trouble later identifying which cable is coming from where so very important label everything put a label on the patch panel that identifies the outlet in another room and you might also want to put the number of the patch panel outlet onto the the connector in in the different room when I built my own home network, I thought, well, I have that 16 port switch and that is largely enough because I only have like eight or 10 devices I want to connect to the switch. Trust me, over time, you will add more devices. It, you don't necessarily run more cables, but maybe you add a Raspberry Pi, maybe you add a server, maybe you add something, or maybe you want to run a phone line or something. Do overdimension the switch. So if you're running 12 cables, use a 24 port switch. There are standards available for cabling, but it would be too easy if there was only one standard, right? The most commonly used standard is T568B, and that is the way the wires are, are paired. Basically, the, the first pair of wires goes to four and five, the second pair to three and six, that is green, and brown goes to seven and eight, and orange to one and two. Now, why would you want to use a standard? It's very easy because you could easily not use, not stick to a standard and, and wire the cables with different color components if you wire both ends of the cable. Now, if you want to redo something one day, it's best practice to stick to a standard. It doesn't really matter if you're using standard 568A, which I will show in a second once I have removed the cables, or 568B. But my advice would be choose a standard. The most commonly used is T568B and stick to it. That will really, really help you if you need to add components or if somebody else needs to do stuff on your installation because they will immediately know which color has to be connected to, to which pin of, uh, of the installation.
while you're watching me undo the cables, that might be a good moment to give me a like if you like the video. Now you might ask, why are the wires wired the way they are? Why did we not just use pairs on pin 1, 2, then 3, 4, then 5, 6? The answer is very easy. That was made to be compatible with phone connectors. On a phone connector, the pins 4 and 5 are typically, typically connected to the phone line and also the pins 3 and 6 are used for another pair. Well, hang on, did Mark just say phone connector? For my younger viewers, in former times, phones looked like this. And yes, they were connected to the wall with a cord and there was an outlet in the wall where you connected the phone to. So you could just walk around within the reach of the cable while you were on the phone. Ask your mom, ask your dad, they will know. Here's a view from behind the scenes, which you normally wouldn't see if inside the rack. You can nicely see the colored keystones and I will show you how to connect those cables. When I did that video the first time, I <laughs> realized the camera wasn't running when I connected the first two cables. So I, have to, I had to redo this again with the third cable. But hey, it's just a learning experience, right? So um, the only difference between the third cable and the two cables that are already connected is that the third cable is shielded. So I'm just removing the exceed of the shield and um, so, so that I don't have to do that later on. Anyhow, invest in good cable. It's, it's not a huge price difference between a good cable and, and the bad cable. What's a good cable? What's a bad cable? A good cable, it's thicker, it, it doesn't break immediately. And um, sometimes, you know, the, the, you, you remove the isolation and the cables, the wires easily break. And that leads me to another tip. Always check the cables for damage. When you remove the isolation, it, it might occur to you that you actually accidentally broke one, one wire. And so if you check those for damages before you connect them, it might save you the time to search for the problem. Next tip is to really remove cut wires immediately. We will see in a second when we punch those in that, that the, there are always small pieces of wires or in, in this case, the, the, the ground wire from the shield. Remove them immediately from the case so that you don't have pieces of wire short-circuiting the whole installation. Now I'm just fixing the cable very, very tightly so that it doesn't move. This way you can prepare the cables for, for punching them into the keystones. When you undo the cables to put them into the keystones, make sure that you undrill them only as far as necessary because every millimeter you undrill them or every piece you undrill them will have an impact on the quality of the signal. So only do the strict minimum here. Before you punch them in, put them between the keystones and, and hold them still. However, if you're preparing the cables for connection, do not bend them more than necessary because if you bend the cables too much, the quality of the signal will also suffer and you might not be able to do the gigabit network over that cable. I'm using a quite inexpensive tool here to, to push the cables in, but do not buy the cheapest tool. If you buy a cheaper tool, you might have additional headache putting the cables in. I'm not saying that you should invest hundreds of dollars into a tool if you're only doing this once, but uh, it, you should at least invest, I don't know, 20 or 30 dollars. That might do. Before pushing the cables in, try to grip them with a little scissors. That tool has a, a, a pair of little scissors. I will show the tool in detail later. And um, um, just try to grip the cable with a little scissors and then push it in because this way the tool will punch the cable in and also cut the, the exceeding uh, piece of cable. Now, you, you will end up with a lot of small pieces of, of, of cable in, in your patch panel. And uh, my next advice would be remove them immediately. 
because you don't know if, if they are loose in the case and if you do many of, of those you might lose track of, of whether there is still pieces of cable in there and that might short circuit stuff. So always remove this immediately and just make sure that, that, that you keep the inside of the patch pan really, really nice and clean. So once you get used to this, once you do your 10th or 20th installation, then you may actually do this really, really fast. <laughs> it takes a bit of exercise in the beginning, but don't worry. So this is a view of the patch panel once it's mounted from the, from the back. With my mock environment, I can easily show the back, which you would normally not see in a rack. So how are we going to connect other rooms and other access points in, 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 in other, on other floors? It's pretty much the same type of connector with the keystones and, and there are various types of connectors available. Some of these come with a little plastic tube where you can easily push the cables in or you might also use one I'm showing here which, which has actually two connectors and, and that's another tip I want to give you guys, always run an extra cable. Always run two cables instead of one. Let's say you want to connect the PC and one day you find out that you might want to connect a, a phone or, or another device or we don't know what's coming in the future. It is not more work to run two cables than it is actually to run one cable. So it's always good to have a spare cable if you, if you need a cable and you don't have one that's not good. So here I'm showing the details of the tool. You can see that there is a little a pair of little scissors and um, here you can see if you, if you grip the cable with the scissors before and then push it in the tool will cut the exceeding piece of wire and at the same time push it into the keystones. I have also bought a little cable tester, that's another tip to do, invest in a little cable tester. You do not, again, you do not have to use the most expensive one if you only do this once. You may use a cheap one, but I have a very, very cheap one and uh, sometimes it's got bad contact, so uh, don't use the, the cheapest. I mean, at least make sure it's got proper connectors. I think I paid like 15 or 20 dollars for this one. What this does, it, it's just testing every single cable pair and it's putting some current through them and illuminating the LEDs if there is a correct connection. This is a CAT7 wire. The other cables I've been showing were CAT5 and CAT5E cables. Now you can see that the color coding is exactly the same. The main difference between a CAT7 and a CAT5 cable is that it is capable of transmitting higher frequencies. That means if you think you might be going to 10 gigabit network in the near future, then it's probably better to put the CAT7 cables through. The way the cables achieve this is by individually isolating or shielding, rather shielding, sorry, the individual cable pairs and also they are always shielded. And uh, on top of that, I have experienced that the category seven cables are usually a bit thicker. Another tip if you choose a switch, but my advice would be look for a silent switch because you do not want a, an additional fan making a lot of noise. So those switches are not really expensive as I said before. Oversize them, choose a switch with, with more ports. It, it will save you a lot of headache and, and they started I think 70 bucks and um, if you invest, I don't know, 70, 80 bucks, you should get a decent switch these days. I'm not affiliated with any vendor, so choose the brand you have most confidence in. Last tip, if you're doing a home network installation, add a UPS, that's an uninterruptible power supply so that the installation doesn't go down if, if a fuse is blown or if the grid goes down. And we will actually be doing this in the next episodes. I will show how to build a 12 volt mini UPS for your router. And um, I will also show how to monitor and alert a UPS using Tesmota flashed uh, son of switches. We will also be looking into use for old routers, build a managed switch, do auto failover to LTE so that your internet connection is always up even if your DSL or cable provider goes down. We will have a look at how to extend the router's memory and how to use a router as a NAS storage. So there's a lot of stuff coming. Make sure you subscribe guys. Thank you very much for watching. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.